What's going on guys? I'm Tyler and I might be late to the party on this one, but nevertheless I'm here to let you know that Shadow is no perfect movie. And it takes place in a kingdom where a military commander has this shadow or decoy, a person that bears an uncanny resemblance to him, and he decides to use this shadow in order to launch a coup that will overthrow both their own king and the rival kingdom who has a very valuable piece of land that belongs rightfully to them. And I first heard about this movie from seeing Chris Stuckman review it on his channel. I thought, wow, he's reviewing a new martial arts movie. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's a new martial arts movie in U.S. theaters, but we, we fucking Canadians, we don't get that, really? At least, I didn't get it any city nearby me. I, uh, the closest thing we have are Blu-rays that we could buy without seeing it, without knowing whether or not we were going to like it. But one day, I was in Walmart, I came across that, and I thought... Screw it. I'll buy it. I'll take a chance. Even if I don't like it, it'll fit nice in my cabinet. I watched it, and um, yeah, it actually was pretty good. I can't say that I loved it as much as Stuckman did, but maybe he was right about it being, like, best seen in theaters. And the only time I realistically would have gotten the chance to see it in theaters was 2018 during TIFF, if I knew about it. More and more, as I say in my videos, the movies I miss at TIFF end up being the fucking best. Imagine my luck. I wonder how much luck I'm gonna get this year. Anyways, on to the movie. What is great about Shadow is that, at its core, it's not really a martial arts movie. It's a conspiracy spy thriller with martial arts fight sequences, because the whole plan, the whole scheme to overthrow this king who is unbelievably pathetic and cowardly and his idea of settling disputes with his rival kingdom is by compromising to their own demands he'd give his younger sister away as a fucking concubine let alone as a wife a fucking concubine in order to appease them in order to prevent any chance of war and you might say well he's preventing a war what's the problem there well, it's the kind of war that makes the entire kingdom look like complete pushovers. But weirdly enough, he's not really that much of a pushover himself. He's just lazy because he knows how much power he has as king. He knows how much authority he can abuse on his own subjects. And you can tell based on how many people there are who un unbelievably just kiss up to him and completely blindly agree to him to everything that he says versus the much larger amount of subjects and soldiers who openly say, you're an idiot, fuck you, we're going to war over this. So you obviously understand why this coup is necessary for the survival of the kingdom, but what makes it an even more intense conspiracy thriller is that the conspirators have different agendas and different ideas on how to go about this. For example, the Shadow himself. He obviously wants to fight for his own freedom, because as a shadow, he's under the control of this incredibly cunning and ruthless commander who may or may not see him as a loose end once this is over, and may really just want the throne for himself as opposed to doing it for the good of other people. Not only that, the shadow has a romance with another co-conspirator that I don't want to spoil, because it really keeps him on the edge of his toes, it just adds on to the piles of secrets that everyone in this movie is hiding and that's the great thing about this movie every character has something to hide something that if they give away even in the slightest it will ruin their own survival everyone is simultaneously their most trusted ally and their most feared enemy at the exact same time and that's what makes it really intense when the battle sequences do happen but before we get into that, I want to talk about the black and white color scheme that if you've seen the movie, if you've heard anything about the movie, you probably know going in. This is a film with very minimal color. It is only black, white, and gray, except during the battles where it's blood, 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 very bright red blood. But it was always so surprising to hear about it coming from the director of Hero, House of Flying Daggers, Curse of the Golden Flower, movies where color is basically a character of its own and the weird thing is even though it's just black white and gray the colors still are their own character in this movie they're allegedly based on the designs of chinese ink wash paintings and i did a little research onto what really comes into drawing an ink wash painting and what i found out is that it's not really about capturing the image that you're painting 
bit by bit. It's more covering the spirit of this being or this random flower. It isn't just drawing the petals as perfectly as possible. It's capturing whether or not it's blooming, whether or not it's slowly fading out. If you're drawing a person, it's not about their facial features. It's about what emotions they're expressing. And because in this movie, this kingdom is not only a complete pushover to a rival kingdom, but their own king as well, the black and white and gray atmosphere makes everything seem completely dreary and cynical, which really suits the feelings of these subjects. But once in a while, there's still a glimmering hope of optimism because the use of white, the use of gray, and the different shades of black actually make it the movie still look stunning thanks to the production design, the costume design, the very clever use of color symbolism in regards to the costumes of the characters. Because the Shadow himself, whenever he's masquerading as the commander, he's dressed in black on the outside but white on the inside to show that dude's an imposter among all these battle scar soldiers who know a lot more than he does who are all dressed in either black or gray or both. Just scenes between him and the commander when he's dressed in all white versus the commander who's dressed in all black with little shades of gray, you know for a fact who's the more naive and innocent, gullible moron as opposed to the ruthless and cunning and occasionally sinister individual. And as time goes by, as this shadow begins to become more violent, begins to experience the hardships of war and betrayal, his colors on his costumes become darker in shades, much more gray, splattered with blood everywhere to show how much blood he's shed or how much, how much attacking he's been under, which we're finally going to get to the battle sequences. They are spectacular. This is fight choreography at some of its most beautiful. Slow motion in this movie is a great way to show the choreography, how much strategy really goes into using your fists. It isn't about your strength. It's about where you hit someone. It's about whether or not your opponent has any stamina. And this movie not only sheds a good amount of philosophy in regards to fight choreography, but it does a really good job at showing it. Thankfully, the slow motion is never overutilized. And it's never the star of the show. The star of the show is the actors doing their own stunts, using these incredibly creative weapons. As you may have seen from the Blu-ray, the big star of the show is a razor-coated umbrella that works as kind of like Captain America's shield. It's a good defensive and offensive weapon at the exact same time, only in this one it's heightened up greatly, especially during the climax where we have an entire army of people with these umbrellas they're not just waving them around they have contraptions that can shoot blades they can do so many badass things that i don't want to spoil because i really think more people should seek out this movie even if you haven't seen that many chinese or even foreign films in general there's still a lot about this movie for western audiences to appreciate and that's one of the great things about the director of hero and house of flying daggers i'd try and say his name but I'd probably fuck it up anyways. My issues with the movie are pretty minor when it comes down to it. The one the one that really sticks out, first of all, is that the musical score, while it is really good, it feels very minimalist. It relies mostly on this instrument called a lute. It all sounds beautiful, but sometimes it's so loud that it kind of overlaps between the character's dialogue. And even with subtitles, you can't really take your mind off of how distracting the music sounds. It is really good, but because this lute only has a few strings of its own, whenever it plays the same notes over and over again, it also gets a little bit repetitive. It's kind of like the piano theme from Eyes Wide Shut. Like, it sounds great the first time, but as time goes by, it's just like, how many times do we have to listen to this over and over? And the other big problem is that the pacing during the first act spends a lot of time just explaining the rules of this universe, which... Felt weird at first because the movie opens with a crawl to explain like this kingdom overtook this one. Now they live in famine. And I'm just like, do we really need a title card? You guys are going to spend a half hour explaining the past of this kingdom, what people are going to expect from the future, the past of all these soldiers, even ones who are in only like one or two scenes. Even after rewatch and especially after rewatch, it gets a little old just waiting for the excitement to happen, but once the commander starts to train his shadow to be ready to 
to be ready for combat, to be ready to face up against an opponent who has seen the real commander and hopefully will not suspect anything. Once that kicks in, the movie is intense, it is action-packed, it is really well acted. The actor who plays the commander and the shadow, because it is one actor playing both these characters, did a really good job. It took me... I watched it like two times and I didn't even notice that. Props to the makeup department for making them look so seamless and the special effects department especially because there are moments where they touch each other physically and there's no CG, obviously. At least, I'm not entirely sure how they pulled it off, but whatever they did, it worked out very well. So, as you can tell, I had a great time with Shadow and it's on Netflix, so I would suggest more Western audiences give it a try. It's not like the rest of us have that much else going for life right now. But anyways, I'm going to give Shadow a 4 out of 5. Guys, thanks as always for watching. If you have seen Shadow, do let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Be sure to stay tuned for more reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.